Um, I do this uh, presentation on, you know, benefits planning the basics every month um, for anybody in the state that's interested. And so if you did have people further down the road that wanted to review this or wanted to be on some of my uh, live trainings, just let me know. I create a whole training list for the whole year. I do a lot of micro training on specific uh, benefits, work incentives. Um, and then this is just the one that I do monthly. So it's the information that I'm going to give you is going to make your head hurt. I mean, I, I probably shouldn't say it like that, but it does kind of make your head hurt a little bit because it's a lot of information. And and I I really feel like there should be more of us out there that uh, have this expertise in benefits counseling. Um, to get certified, it takes about a year and a half. And then you have uh, continuing ed credits, 18 of them a year. So it's quite a lengthy process. Um, so I work for Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation. I'm also a certified um, rehabilitation counselor as well as a certified community partner in benefits planning. Um, every one of our Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation offices has a trained benefits planner. Not all of them are certified, um, but they're able to assist our job candidates. So we work together as a team to ensure that all of our Social Security job candidates get the information they need to make informed choices about work. So today we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to try to help you understand how income affects Social Security disability benefits and SSI. <clears throat> so to understand those work incentives, I, I want you to understand the safety nets that they provide to the people that we serve to either help them to gradually transition off benefits or to supplement their benefit with work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to start out with the Social Security's definition of disability. Um, I'm going to read it to you and then I want to break it down so that you understand exactly what they're saying. It's the inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity due to a mental or physical impairment that's expected to last at least 12 months or result in death. So when we break that down, we start out with the inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity or SGA. That literally means the individual is not able to work and, and earn over SGA. So the SGA level is set each year and for 2023, that's $1,470 in gross wages in a month. The individuals uh, who meet that criteria for statutory blindness, the SGA level this year is $2,460. So the next part of the definition is that this disability needs to be due to a medical or a mental impairment that's determined by Social Security. And then the third part is that it's expected to last at least 12 months or result in death. In other words, the disability is not temporary. So because Social Security's definition of disability depends on not being able to work at a substantial level and also on the actual disability, Social Security is going to do two different reviews of an individual's case. One is the work review, which is done when the individual's working, and then the other one is the medical review. And most job candidates don't know um, that there's a work review as well as a medical review. So with the medical review, depending on the type of disability, Social Security is going to review every beneficiary on a three, five, or seven-year review cycle. So most individuals that experience a mental health disability are going to be reviewed medically. They're going to be reviewed every three years because medical recovery is expected, according to Social Security. But an individual, say, with Down syndrome will be reviewed every seven years because medical recovery is unlikely. So this definition is applied to SSDI and SSI, and there are also many other eligibility criteria depending on which benefit the individual receives. So we're going to do first a high level overview of comparison of both of the benefits, and then I'll go into the weeds with each of them. So, and I do stop throughout the presentation for questions. Um, so if I'm, I'm not there yet, but the next slide is all my question, you know, my time for questions. So go ahead and if you're afraid you're going to forget it, that's what happens to me. Just write it down and then we'll have, we'll stop on the next slide. So it's important for us to understand what benefits an individual receives. There's two disability benefits that are available under Social Security. We're going to start with the one that most of you will qualify for if you became disabled. 
it's called Social Security Disability Insurance. So when we work, we pay a tax called the Federal Insurance Contributions Act or FICA taxes. This is the money that the federal government takes out of your paycheck to set aside for you for your retirement. This is called a Title II Social Security benefit, and we can collect this benefit at the age of 62 with a 25% reduction or at our full retirement age with no reduction. So this benefit comes out of what they call that Social Security Trust Fund. It's like an insurance policy. Since you paid in to it, you're entitled to it if you became disabled. So the amount that you receive is based on how long you worked and how much money you made. In 2023, the highest possible benefit that an individual would be getting at their full retirement is $3,627. Doesn't matter how much they make, that's the most they could get this year. If you retired at 62 this year, the highest possible benefit would be $2,572. And then if you waited until the age of 70, which is when the increases stop, the highest amount possible would be $4,555. But most of us aren't even close to those amounts. So this benefit is called insurance because if you become disabled before your full retirement, you draw off of the work record as if you're fully retired. If an individual is able to go back to work and earn income, Social Security is going to count the earnings when the money is earned. There's many work incentives that can provide safety nets so that the individual doesn't just automatically lose the whole cash benefit. They can gradually transition off the benefit. With SSDI, there's a mandatory five month waiting period before receiving that first payment. And then after being on the benefit for 24 months, an individual is gonna be covered by Medicare health insurance. That's the one with all the parts. There's some medical conditions though that are so significant that Social Security does waive that 24 month um, wait and their Medicare starts immediately like ALS. There's like 125 of them. I can't pronounce most of them. The other thing that's really new is that that five month uh, mandatory waiting period before you get your first uh, cash deposit, um, they now allow for anyone that's been diagnosed with ALS to get that immediately upon entitlement. <clears throat> so, so that's Social Security Disability Insurance, the whole Social Security Trust Fund, okay? But there are a lot of individuals that are born with a disability or they acquire it really early in life and they don't have a work history. They haven't worked, they haven't earned enough quarters to qualify for a Title II, you know, that trust fund money. So the federal government gives them enough money for their shelter and food. This amount is set each year, and it's called the federal benefit rate. And for 2023, that amount is $914. So the funding for SSI doesn't come out of the Social Security Trust Fund. It comes out of general treasury dollars. This is a financially needy program. So everything affects it. If you only need $914 for your shelter and food, and let's say your grandmother gives you $100 for your birthday, then now you don't need $914, right? Because you have this $100. There's a calculation. There's some exclusions. So also if someone is providing all or some of your shelter and food, then Social Security would automatically reduce that check by a third. Okay. If an individual goes to work and is receiving SSI, then Social Security counts their income from working when it's received. So those three pay period months will have a greater effect on the individual's SSI check. Um, with this benefit, the individuals, well, if you're in Iowa, you automatically qualify uh, for Medicaid. Some states you have to actually apply. <coughs> so questions on that first introductory part. Excuse me. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next part. Now we're going to kind of get into the weeds about the two different benefits. So this is a list of the benefits um, under the Social Security Disability Insurance. Again, this is a benefit that you receive based on your work history. Somebody have a question? No? Okay. So there's three phases that a job candidate goes through before going off of SSDI. And the first phase is called the trial work period. This 
is a period of time when the individual can work and earn as much as they want without any effect on their cash benefits or medical insurance. A trial work month will only be triggered if they earn over $1,050 a month in gross wages. Social Security always looks at gross wages, less the person is self-employed, and then it's figured a little differently. The trial work period months are not necessarily triggered consecutively. The job candidate might use all nine months during one work attempt or over several different work attempts while they're finding that right employment fit. If the job candidate's self-employed, then Social Security is going to look at either $1,050 in net earnings from self-employment or if they're contributing more than 80 hours a month of work in their business, then that would also count as a uh, trial work month. So after that ninth trial work month has been triggered, then Social Security looks to see if that job candidate's earnings are at that substantial gainful activity level, or SGA. That's when that comes into play. So it's important to make sure um, that you're, you're communicating with Social Security and reporting income monthly. And sometime toward the end of that trial work period, the job candidate is going to want Social Security to review their work activity to see if, if they are really at that SGA level wages. So that was phase one. Do you have any questions about that? <laughs> Okay, so these are the numbers for this year, substantial gainful activity or SGA. So that work activity report, it needs to get submitted to Social Security. Most people will just wait until Social Security alerts them that they want to do a work activity report. But I got to tell you, Social Security is really overwhelmed. I mean, there's like 10,000 boomers that are retiring every day, and that's going to go on for like another 10 years. So, and, and a lot of their staff left during uh, COVID and haven't come back. I mean, you know, they retired. And so it's, they're very overwhelmed. Um, and so that's why we try to help at Voc Rehab to um, get that work activity report completed um, so that we can help social security. Um, because job candidates want to know where they're at. They want to know if I have a period of time like the trial work where I can make as much as I want, wouldn't you want to make as much as you can. I mean, it's pretty important. So Social Security has two forms. Um, 820 is the self-employment one and 821 is the work activity report if you work for somebody else. So this form is going to help Social Security identify those other work incentives that might actually lower the amount of the earned income so that the, the Social Security benefit is going to continue. And those work incentives that, that are identified in that form are impairment related work expenses and subsidy. So um, you can assist the job candidate and Social Security, like I said, by submitting all of that paperwork along with pay statements directly to Social Security through their work track fax number. Um, they kind of got a lot more techno technologically savvy um, with COVID and they've um, improved their systems quite a bit. And obviously taking things to the office doesn't make sense. Um, things get lost mailing things, things get lost. But this work track fax system, basically you're faxing it in and it's going into their system electronically. The office manager, I've been told, is supposed to then assign it to one of their claims rep. I don't know that that actually happens, but it doesn't matter because they have a record of it and that can't get lost. And that's really important for our job candidates. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next work incentive. There, just wouldn't move forward. Okay, <clears throat> so phase two starts the month after the ninth trial work month has been triggered. So now Social Security is looking at whether the job candidate's work activity equals that SGA. This phase is called the extended period of eligibility, and it's going to last 36 months. These 36 months are consecutively triggered and they're going to click away even if the job candidate has no work activity. 
during this extended period of eligible, the person remains eligible for the cash benefit, even if their earnings exceed SGA. So what that means is that in the months that their gross earnings do exceed SGA, they're not entitled to the cash benefits, but they're still eligible for them. So this is when we're going to see a lot of overpayments occurring with Social Security. That's why we want to help people um, make sure that Social Security is tracking them and that they're reporting. So what happens is even if a job candidate thinks that Social Security shouldn't deposit that cash benefit because they know they're working and they're making a high income and they know they've reported that they're working, they are going to, most job candidates are going to assume that if Social Security deposits that monthly cash benefit, then they're probably supposed to keep it, right? Um, yeah, no, the job candidate needs to keep good track of whether they're entitled to the cash benefit. And it's important to realize that it will need to be repaid even if it's five, 10 years down the road. So our counselors assist job candidates in understanding when the cash benefit should end and then how to report um, their gross income to Social Security. So during this extended period of eligibility, if the person loses the job, gets fired, or for whatever reason is no longer at SGA, then they can request that their cash benefit be restarted. If they're under SGA, and that's without an application. So they stay connected for those three years. So for any reason, they don't even, you know, whatever reason, they just have to be below SGA. Social Security doesn't even really care. So also during this period of time, their Medicare, the health insurance is going to continue for up to 93 months after the trial work period ends. So there's also three grace months. So these are allowed for the individual once the trial work, um, the last trial work, the ninth trial work month has been triggered. The first month after that ninth month has been triggered, if when the individual earns over SGA, that's going to be called their cessation month. And then the next two months are their grace months. This is a block of three and the job candidate gets to keep the cash benefit for all three. If their wages go below SGA at any time after that, they just call Social Security to restart their benefits with no application or even a reason, no reason is required. So cessation of benefits essentially means that cash benefits are suspended. Benefit termination, though, can't occur due to earned income unless the beneficiary has used all of their trial work, all of this three years of extended period of eligibility and they've used the cessation and grace months. <clears throat> Questions on that? Okay, so um, uh, these are two work incentives that were rolled out as part of the Ticket to Work Improvement Act. And both of these provisions happen after the beneficiary has been terminated due to SGA level wages. Now remember the termination cannot occur until the beneficiary used all nine of their trial work months. They've completed that 36 month extended period of eligibility and they've used their three grace months. So extended Medicare continues their Medicare coverage for a total of seven years after the end of their trial work period. This means that the beneficiary is entitled to that premium free Part A, that's hospitalization coverage, as well as the Part B coverage, um, as long as they continue to pay that monthly premium. This year that actually went down. I don't know, all the years I've been doing this, it's only always gone up. This year it actually went down, which is super cool. Um, I think it's hundred and still trying to memorize all of them. It's $164.90 a month. Um, now they're going to have to continue to pay that unless they have a also qualify for a Medicaid coverage in Iowa or for the extra help. And then the state of Iowa might be paying for that premium. <clears throat> the other work incentives called the use, it's uh, expedited reinstatement of benefits. And and this period of time lasts for five years um, after the month that the individual is terminated. So again, for someone on Social Security Disability Insurance or SSDI, that, termina that termination of benefits must be due to SGA level wages after the trial work period has been used, 
after that 36 month extended period of eligibility and then after those grace months. So the beneficiary just needs to contact Social Security. Social Security will restart the provisional benefits for up to six months and as well as their Medicare if that's ended. And then during this provisional period, Social Security will do a medical review to determine if the impairment is related to that original impairment. Um, if it's a new one, then the benefits would end, but they don't make the, the beneficiary pay back. Um, this benefit can also apply the expedited reinstatement to individuals on SSI. Um, but I have actually never seen it happen with them because of um, most people aren't going to that are on SSI aren't going to exceed the state's Medicaid threshold, um, which this year actually went up to $48,198 in annually. Um, the other thing that would happen is if an individual were earning that much, they would probably switch over to Iowa's um, Medicaid buy-in program. It's called Medicaid for Employed Persons with Disabilities. It has higher resource limits and they exclude retirement funds. So uh, we have a great option in Iowa. These other work incentives are also safety nets and they need to be considered by Social Security when determining whether or not the individual's actually at that substantial gainful activity level. And like I said, I do a lot of micro trainings on all of these uh, work incentives. Quarterly, I do a training on the plan to achieve self-support, um, but I do a four part one on self-employment because it's really complicated. Questions? <laughs> that was the end of SSDI, so. Everybody's so quiet. Are they all still there? They're all still here. OK. All right, so we're going to move on then to SSI, OK? Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. Uh, this is a benefit, again, that's provided to individuals that are 18 to 65 who have a disability that impacts their ability to work. The full amount of an SSI cash benefit is based on that federal benefit rate, which is the amount an individual needs for shelter and food. So this year in 2023, that amount is $914 a month. If someone else is providing your shelter and food, then Social Security is going to automatically reduce the benefit by a third. Um, everything affects this benefit. Unearned income is almost a dollar per dollar reduction of the benefit. Earned income is more like for every two dollars you earn, you, uh, your check would be reduced by a dollar. So SSI is a benefit for those who have low income and resources, individuals that don't have that work history to draw off of. There's also resource limits related to this program, 2,000 for a single individual or 3,000 for a couple. There are going to be some resources that are excluded from counting, such as the home that you live in that you own um, or the vehicle that you need for work. Again, in Iowa, you're going to automatically be enrolled in Medicaid. And then the money that funds SSI, again, does not come out of that Social Security Trust Fund. This is a financially needy program. Um, it, that one third reduction, if someone else is providing shelter and food, we see that a lot when students turn 18 and the parents, you know, they feel bad about ask, you know, get having their child with a disability pay for their share of the household expenses. Um, but I, I see it as a rite of passage. They should. And besides, otherwise, it's going to get reduced by a third. And this year, that's uh, $304.67 that it would be reduced by. One thing I think parents ask a lot about is, well, do I then have to pay taxes on that rental income? No, I talked to, I when I had my business, I, I used a CPA and she said, it's it's not rental income. It's like your roommates and they're just paying their fair share. And that's what you should call it. I do a lot of uh, counseling support with parents um, to help them understand that because I think it they do feel that kind of bad about it, um, but they shouldn't. So um, there's a couple of other age groups that are going to also qualify for SSI. <laughs> the first one is under age 18. 
the definition for disability does not include work. So for a student to qualify for SSI under the age of 18, that family has to have very low income and resources. Um, Social Security is going to compare how that student with a disability compares to their unimpaired peer in learning. So you're often going to see students with a learning disability um, that aren't going to qualify as an adult because they can, they're able to work. There's the other group is individuals that are over the age of 65. Um, they do not have to have a disability to qualify for SSI. These are individuals who don't have a work history to draw off of, right? So they're not going to get SSDI. They're individuals that through their out their whole life, they've had low income and resources. At 65, then they would also qualify for Medicare. So they'll have Medicare and Medicaid. The rules for working, though, that we're going to go into that a little further are going to be the same for all of these groups. Um, but it is a little bit different for students. And we're going to I'm going to go into that and explain to you the work incentives related to students with disabilities. Any questions about that? <laughs> yeah, I know it. It is overwhelming. I'm sorry. Like what I do. I don't mean to overwhelm you, but it's just a lot of stuff. That's why we do a lot of one on one with families. Um, we do a parent night every second Thursday, you know, to really, you know, parents can come on and we have a lawyer from um, the Office of Public Guardianship that shows up and she just answers any questions related to guardianship. I talk to him about SSI and when to apply and we have a lot of counselors that are on there that explain what our VR services are that can be provided. I also have way more knowledge than I originally wanted about Medicaid and Medicare and the waivers and I you know, I think that's an interesting piece, too, because people are so worried about, yeah, I want my kid to work, but I, they can't lose their Medicaid, they can't lose their waiver. And there's so many work incentive provisions that um, provide safety nets so that they don't. So I'm just going to move right into it because we're already halfway through. Okay, so the 2023 amount, what you need for your shelter and food. $914. That went up a lot this year. It's a, it's a huge, huge uh, change for people. So we're going to start out looking at SSI under 18. <laughs> Social Security defines disability for individuals who are under 18 by comparing their development with that of their peers. So in other words, are they able to learn at the same level as their same age peers? Most students in Iowa under the age of 18 are not going to qualify for SSI because of the parents, because of the household income and the household resources. What this means is if a student is under age 18 and receiving SSI based on their disability, this family is poor. So any income that the parents have is gonna be deemed to the child and it's gonna reduce their benefit. Uh, resource limits are a little different. It's 2000 for that eligible child plus another 2000 if it's just one parent or through another 3,000 if it's two parents. So like a maximum of 5,000. Um, child support that that eligible child uh, gets is not deemed, but it actually counts as unearned income. So it's almost a dollar per dollar reduction. Although if they're under 18, they do um, exclude a third of it. Um, so if you think about it, because this family's poor, uh, they're not going to want to risk losing that student's SSI. It's $914. They don't want the student to go to work. They don't understand that there's these work incentives. Um, they don't have all the facts, and that's why it's really important for us to help them understand. Students under the age of 18 that are receiving an SSI benefit, they can take advantage of a work incentive called the Student Earned Income Exclusion if the program that the student's involved with qualifies. So the student earned income exclusion should be applied automatically. Um, but when the student, it seems like in Iowa anyway, when the student is over 18, a lot of our social security office are gonna assume that this student is out of school, um, which isn't true. And I don't understand how to, I don't know how to get them to correct that. So it's important though, our staff is uh, really diligent about checking that benefits plan inquiry that we get from social security uh, to determine if the students, you know, 
if they're applying that to the student's record. It should be automatic. Sometimes we have to help them out with that and send them information about the training program that the student is in. The local office, though, uh, does the analysis and they determine if if the individual qualifies. So if the decision is negative though, with every decision with social security, you always have the right to appeal, even up to the level of an appearance before an administrative law judge. People are afraid to do this and they really shouldn't be because it, it it's their right. Um, <laughs> so the exclusion is $2,220 per month of earned income up to a maximum annual of 8950 that's for this year so the st student just needs to be regularly attending school and one of the things we started doing because we had a lot of this happening in the des moines um, social security office where they would just say hey that's not really you know that's not really school that's you know they're learning work stuff well that's important too and social security should still be excluding it so what we've been doing is we take a copy um, we take a picture of the person the student's id and then we also uh, take a picture of the class schedule and send that into social security along with their first month's pay statements so uh, uh you know it has different hours that make it so whether or not they qualify but a program could count even if the hours are less if it's something outside of the student's control like say illness or some other circumstances that might justify that reduced uh, credit load or attendance so um, going back to those students that are on benefits prior to the age of 18 the age 18 redetermination is going to occur sometime before that student's 19th birthday now this comes as a huge surprise to most families because obviously the student their child has not changed from you know the day before they're 18 to now they're 18 um, but remember the definition of disability did change oh uh, the student qualified under 18 it was because compared to their peers in learning and development um, they were below but at the age of 18 now the question is can they work so I think it was in 2010 we did a Kaizen a lot of state agencies sent people um, it was fascinating experience to go through but what we were looking at was this you know how is this happening and what can we put in place to um, you know to make this better for people in our students in Iowa because every year Iowa has about 600 students that will go through this age 18 redetermination process and about 67% will not meet that adult criteria for disability. Um, I, I honestly, I mean, I've been at Voc Rehab now for four years, almost four years, and I, I believe that part of the reason is that we got to get the information out to the parents um, that this is going to happen. They don't know what's coming. Um, but the other thing is they get that packet of information from Social Security anytime after their 18th birthday up till their 19th birthday, right? So they're not even thinking age 18. And it comes like a green packet of information and it says this is your application for adult SSI. And I think parents look at that and go, well, they're already on SSI and they throw it away. I really think that's what's happening in a lot of cases. Um, but why do I, you know, put so much importance on this? It's because of this other provision um, that, that can provide support, and it's called Section 301. Section 301 provides continuing SSI or SSDI cash payments to any individual who's been determined by Social Security to have medically recovered, either through that age 18 redetermination or even a regular continuing disability review. They've been determined to have recovered. For those who receive SSI under the age of 18, this can happen at the age 18 redetermination because of the fact that the definition of disability changes. And now it includes that ability to work. So at age 18, at that redetermination, Social Security renders a new medical decision. The other time that this occurs is when a job candidate subject to those continuing disability reviews, like I said in the very beginning, where everybody's on a three, five, or seven year review cycle. Um, so to qualify for Section 301, the job candidate, they have to already 
have an approved individual plan for employment or what we call an IPE with Voc Rehab or another entity that provides support like workforce development or an employment network, um, they already have to have that in place. Um, this section 301 does apply to both SSI and SSDI and to qualify those on SSI do have to maintain that uh, low resource limit. So an important criteria for our social security is that they're going to look at to see if we continue this um, this plan and we continue to give this person the cash benefits, what's the likelihood that they will return that they will be able to go off benefits. Um, so <clears throat> that's one of the things that we look at and make sure I was just working on data for our staff and we, we serve about I think. 4,700 people um, in our caseload that are on benefits. And, you know, I, I, I look as, at a snapshot of those students, especially that are gonna go through this age 18 redetermination so that we can make sure that we get them enrolled in our services and get that employment plan written. Um, so that if that this does happen, um, they're going to continue to get that cash benefit until they reach their employment goal. And that's really huge for people. Questions. And then we're going to go into a scenario that actually uh, of an individual. So <clears throat> any questions on that? Y'all are so quiet. Okay, so we're going to talk about John and uh, John receives SSI because of his disability and he's over 18. He starts a new job and he makes $650 a month. His gross wages are going to be counted in the month that he receives the money and he has no unearned income. So let's look at how will Social Security apply the work incentives to determine what, you know, his countable earnings are and how it's going to affect his SSI. So IVRS now has um, these calculators. Uh, they've been around for a while, but they've kind of moved. <laughs> for a while, I was paying for a domain just to have them continuing to be there because it's very, very helpful for people to kind of get, get an idea of how working affects their benefits. You know, nobody wants to put their benefit at risk if they don't know how it's going to affect their benefits. And as you can see, it's complicated. Um, so it's now on the IVRS website, and it's probably going to open on my other screen. So here, there you go. This is very simple. It doesn't take into account all of the different scenarios, but it's good enough to help people be able to kind of see. So when we look at John, he doesn't have any unearned income, and there's a little explanation of what qualifies as unearned income. Okay, and then uh, he does have gross wages, $650. Um, we're gonna assume he doesn't have any impairment related work expenses. And then this is the calculation. So they take his 600 in gross earned income and he keeps the first 20, that's the general income exclusion. And then the $65 earned income exclusion, and then they divide it in half. So his countable earned income is $282.50. We're going to subtract that from a full SSI check. So his new SSI is going to be $631.50. What I've seen happen over the years is people will see that and they're like, oh, I quit. <laughs> because they're forgetting that they also have that income that's coming in. So you always want to add it back. And oftentimes, I don't know if you've all used uh, the snipping tool. I think it's probably the best thing since sliced bread, but you just take the little snipping tool and you can cut out the part and you can send it to somebody in, in an email. It's very easy to use and it's very helpful. So any questions about that first part when John's making 650 in the calculation? Uh, 
Okay. So now John, because he's working with his vocational counselor, um, and they've done a lot of re a lot of research. They've done some assessments. ONET assessments are awesome. Interest profile, all of the Department of Labor. Those are simple and easy to use and really can help you understand what the labor market is for a job and whether it's a good choice and whether it's a good choice actually in Iowa and how much money the person can make. So through that process of vocational counseling, John decides he wants to um, be trained as a pharmacy tech. And we know right now that that's really in demand. Um, and so voc rehab can pay for some things, but he wants to know about how, is there anywhere else that he can go to help him pay for his costs? And this is where we're gonna talk about a plan to achieve self-support or PASS. It allows an individual to set aside any income or resources um, that would normally reduce their SSI cash benefit and then use those extra funds to achieve their work goal. The extra funds are income, um, that the job candidate receives. Normally, it would reduce that SSI like in John's case, um, but if he takes that countable income, puts it in a pass account, then Social Security doesn't look at it and he gives them the full check. This is a perfect, um, it's a perfect work incentive for individuals that maybe get an inheritance um, or they just have uh, some unearned income they get every month, like a trust. Um, or a pension, things like that. A few facts about a pass. Um, to be able to do a pass, the job candidate has to have something reduced in their SSI. They have to already be qualified or be able to qualify for SSI. Uh, the pass makes it so that instead of that SSI check being reduced, they can put that countable income into the pass account that they manage themselves or if they have a representative payee, they manage it. And that allows Social Security to give them a full SSI. The extra is then used to pay for anything that's approved by Social Security that was written in the plan. Now, changes occur with almost every plan, and the job candidate just needs to let Social Security, the past specialists um, for our Kansas City region, they need to let them know so that they can, um, you know, make a decision. So let me tell you a little bit about PASS in Iowa. Um, we, Iowa has the highest number of active PASS plans in our four state region, Kansas, Missouri, uh, Nebraska, and Iowa. We have the highest number. Um, our four state region has the highest active PASS plans in the country. We have exceeded uh, the San Francisco region, the New York region, and it's because we see this as a catapult people off benefits, seriously. It's an amazing work incentive. I've got a guy right now, he's just, <laughs> he's, he's sending me emails at all hours of the night, and obviously I should not be checking, but you know, it goes ding and I check. Anyway, <laughs> this guy is so anxious because we've submitted a pass, and he uh, is an individual who uses a wheelchair, and he has a job, he's working full time. His SSI would normally be zero, um, but with the pass, it's he's gonna keep that SSI benefit and he's gonna have all this money set aside to go buy this new van that he needs. And Voc Rehab then will also pay for a modification, which a modification to a van can cost fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. It's a lot of money. Um, but then, you know, the van itself is going to cost fifty or sixty thousand dollars. So, pass is an amazing vehicle to use. So, I want to show you. Um, we also have a pass calculator. Hey, it opened in the right place this time. Again, John has six hundred and fifty in earned income. Now, the calculation is the same, right? His countable earnings are still two hundred and eighty-two dollars and fifty cents. But if he takes that 282, puts it into a separate bank account, Social Security is going to give him that full SSI check of 914. So now every month he's going to have 914. He's going to have 650 gross earned income for 1564 total income. And then he's going to put $282.50 into his pass. So you can see this is an amazing thing. There's a lot of amazing things about it, 
um, mostly I think that it 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 really makes them you know write down all those steps it's going to take that for them to reach that employment goal and and I think that really makes a difference for individuals <laughs> So examples of past expenditures would be supported employment services. Boy, I'm doing a lot more of these right now. Um, we're not doing a good job in our schools with our students, making sure that, that the parents understand that their student is gonna have, that they already have barriers to employment. And so individuals are waiting longer and longer to um, apply for waivers. And what's right now we have, about a five year waiting period for intellectual and brain injury waiver, which is terrible. I mean, it might even be longer than that for both of them right now. Um, it used to be that the AEAs would go in and do those psyche valves, but um, now the people have to go outside and, you know, find somebody and they don't, they don't do it. They think it's gonna be okay. And then they're all of a sudden their child is 18 and all that adult stuff is sitting there and they don't know what to do. So, and they need supports on the job. And so that's why I'm writing more passive with, uh, to fund supported employment services because they're costly. And it's it's just a great tool for that. The other thing that I write a lot of pass for is uh, when people start a business, it can be used for startup costs for a business. Um, usually those last about three years. Um, with the supported employment, it could last up until they get their waiver. Um, education and training. These are the simplest probably paths that you would write because it's all related to uh, they're going to school, you know, and they have to pay tuition and books and all these things. And, you know, stu student loans only go so far and financial aid only goes so far and book rehab can only go so far. So um, you see a lot of those attendant care, um, child care. There aren't very many things that pay for childcare, any equipment or tools, uniforms, just really anything that's related to that person's employment goal can be written into the pass. The shortest pass I ever wrote was four months. Um, and the longest is probably they got a master's degree. And so, you know, that would have been seven, eight years. It, it is though viewed as a short term vehicle. Okay. So, John's graduated. He is starting to work at a pharmacy next door and he's going to make $2,500. Now, how is this going to affect his benefits? Okay. Still, John has no um, unearned income, but he's got gross wages of $2,500. So you can see with this calculation, subtracting 20, subtract 65 and divide in half, his countable earned income is 1207.50. And you subtract that from a full SSI check of 914 and the SSI is at zero. Um, so you know, now John's gonna get really concerned, right? because he's worried they're going to take away my Medicaid. I'm not going to have insurance in this new job for 30 days. And it's not very good. And I spend $4,000 a month on one medication. And then the fear that everybody has when they go to work, what happens if my disability gets worse and I'm not able to work anymore? What's going to happen to me? Um, you know, so, so those are the questions. What about Medicaid? And what if my disability again makes it so I can't work? Good news. This is my favorite work incentive. I know it has a stupid name. It's 1619B or extended Medicaid. Um, Social Security is going to ask a few questions to determine if John has that need for Medicaid to continue. Um, if he does need the coverage and everybody needs the coverage and his SSI cash benefit was reduced to zero because of the fact that he's working, then he's going to be able to keep his Medicaid coverage until he reaches the Medic Iowa's Medicaid threshold. Um, and it's different in every state. 
and he must also remain disabled and also continue to have resources that are less than 2,000 countable for a single person or 3,000 for a couple. And this amount in here, they just released it yesterday. I didn't think about changing it, um, but they just released the 2023 numbers and it's 48,198. Can you see why this is my favorite work incentive? You've got nothing to lose. $914 a month is not enough to live on. And these individuals can make a lot more money and still stay connected to their SSI. And as long as Iowa's um, Health and Human Services Department is, um, they all they see is what Social Security sends them, right? So as long as they see that this person is still connected to SSI, they don't even question, you know, they don't even question it because this individual is still connected to SSI through 1619B, which means they also are still qualified for their waiver services. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Any questions on that? So the other question John had was, what if his disability makes it so he's not able to work? So I've already explained to you about how the person stays connected to SSI. If they quit working, they wouldn't have to go back on, you know, they could go right back on benefits. They wouldn't have to reapply. That connection is still there. That 1619B status, people can stay in that situation for years and years um, as long as they meet the other criteria. So that's the end of my presentation. And this is just a list of all the things that you can do online. And I don't know that this is changing every, I mean, it, constantly it's changing. I remember I, I went into my own social, if you don't have an SSA.gov account, you need to go on and make one. Everybody needs to go on and make it. Make sure that the income that they've put down for you for every year is accurate. The first time I did it for my husband, um, was it, it, he, they had no income for him in 1988. Well, he worked that whole year. In fact, I still had the tax form. Oh, I still do have the tax form. I need to shred that stuff. But anyway, it was good I didn't because I just we just had to go down there and give it to them and they added it to his record. So don't just assume that everything they do is going to be accurate. Um, so it, it, it's really important for people to go on and make an account, ssa.gov. Uh, the other thing is if you're a representative payee for someone, this I found out in during right in the very beginning of COVID, I just happened to go on my account because I'm a little closer to retirement age. And I was curious. And right underneath where it said my social security account, it said representative payee services. That's my daughter who's now 25. So I can actually see her record because I'm her payee. I can if she goes to work, I can actually report her wages through that. Um, you have to get the employer's EIN number, but, um, you know, you can report that online, too. It's great. You should go in there and check it out. Uh, you can apply for Medicare, uh, that extra help through Social Security, that, that Social Security then makes it so that uh, the state of Iowa pays someone's Medicare premiums if their income is pretty low. Um, there's a great little slider calculator now for you can calculate what your benefit will be if you decided to retire at 62 or wait till 66 and a half or maybe 70. It's a pretty cool thing. You can also uh, change your address and phone, although the last time I went in there to try to see if it le actually let you, it didn't. I did go ahead and um, I, I do this periodically just to see you know, what it'll do for our job candidates. I was able to order a, uh, an SS, the, the card, my social security card. I, I got a second copy of it. I didn't really need it, but I wanted to see if I could do it. You can get that benefits verification letter um, if you're doing your taxes. And like I said, you can report online now. So it is 156, believe it or not, we are done. Here's my contact information. Um, you can all send me emails anytime you need to call, get connected with your local uh, vocational rehabilitation office. They all know how to get a hold of me. Um, with our job candidates, typically, if they can't answer the question, they just go ahead and uh, find a spot in my calendar and uh, put it on there and I show up. So.
Any questions? Not Lene. Hi. Hi, Susie. How are you? Good. It was so fun to see you this last fall. Same. I'm sorry, Allison. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say that I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Nope. I made everybody's head hurt. I'm so sorry. No, it was great information. I'm going to have to go back and watch the recording. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. You know, when, when they hired me, they had this vision of let's let's uh you know do this tiered approach to benefits counseling so everybody in the agency would know something about it. you know, provide all this training and and we ended up getting five of our counselors as certified benefits planners through vcu and um you know we thought that was a way to provide the support to the our job candidates i am sad to say that after almost four years it doesn't work that way benefits planning and the work incentives is too difficult. It is too high of a level of expertise. Um, you can't just go to a training once in a while and get it. I mean, I suppose if you came to my training every month or you were constantly asking me questions, which my cadre does, they, they staff a lot of cases with me. Um, some of them feel more comfortable than others. But it is really a huge need. And I, I was telling Allison before everybody got on that I I just I wonder how we can continue to provide employment supports to people with disabilities and not be providing adequate benefits counseling. Because it is not a, a short con one and done, you know, it's not like that. It's a long conversation. And and I think that that's but it's like it just takes a lot and for some reason, we just don't support it in the way that we should. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I don't want to say too much. Yeah, it, it, there's so many people that could use the information. In fact, I've already offered to go into the Social Security offices in Iowa and uh, provide training to their staff because I had a, a parent that called in, I think they were out in Eastern Iowa and um, they had been told about the student or an income exclusion and the the Social Security person said there's no such thing your voc rehab counselor lied to you and you know that's really really sad that they don't know their own rules so yeah I know it was it was one of those oh my goodness I can't believe it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anything I can do to help just let me know it's two o'clock. <laughs> we did it. Yay. That was impressive. Thank you. It's a lot of information, though. On Monday, I'm going to do a two hour training in our local office, and I'll be doing them all across the state um, in all of our VR offices, and all the partners in, are uh, included to come. Uh, you're welcome to come. If you want to get on my Iowa Benefit Planning Network um, listserv, just send me an email. Um, you're going to send them out my email, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Perfect. All righty. You guys well, take you. care. Mm -hmm. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye.